in or out of the International Criminal Court. Angered over an obligation to arrest Vladimir Putin, South Africa's president confused the world, stating his country will withdraw from the ICC. That was later retracted, but questions remain over whether South Africa can host the upcoming BRICS summit with an accused war criminal in attendance. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is South Africa and the ICC. South Africa has struggled with its responsibilities as a signatory to the ICC. Back in 2016, when Sudan's former president and accused war criminal Omar al-Bashir landed in the country for a summit, federal authorities should have arrested him. Instead, they refused, pointing out what they saw as the ICC's double standards. And they proceeded to urge the ratification of a protocol to launch an African Court of Justice and Human Rights. South Africa began a process to withdraw from the ICC, but abandoned that effort in December. And now that decision seems to have come back to haunt them. In March, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Russian president and South African ally Vladimir Putin. And with Putin set to attend the August BRICS summit in Durban, South Africa is again met with an obligation to arrest a foreign head of state on its soil. The dilemma prompted President Cyril Ramaphosa to make this announcement. The governing party, the African National Congress, has taken that decision that uh, it is prudent that uh, the South Africa should pull out of the uh, ICC, largely because of the manner in which the ICC has been seen to be dealing with uh, uh, these types of problems. And there's also been commentary, I believe, from Amnesty International where there's been a reflection uh, on uh, what many people believe is an unfair treatment. Just hours later, Ramaphosa's party, the ANC, issued a confusing retraction, saying South Africa remains a signatory to the Rome Statute and will continue to campaign for equal and consistent application of international law. The episode proved slightly embarrassing in both national and international media, but to be fair, South Africa is not the only country to feel conflicted as a signatory to the court. Here's a look now at the ICC and some of the criticism against it. The ICC, or the International Criminal Court, was established to investigate, prosecute, and try individuals accused of committing the most serious crimes, such as genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. Based in The Hague, Netherlands, the ICC's mission is to end impunity and ensure justice for victims. In 1998, nations came together and signed the Rome Statute, establishing the ICC. And in 2002, it entered into force. In generations to come, thank you. And for the first time in history, states decided to accept the jurisdiction of a permanent international criminal court for the prosecution of crimes committed in their territories or by their nationals. The ICC is made up of 123 countries from all regions, most of Europe and Africa, several Asian and Latin American nations, as well as Canada, while countries like the US and Russia are not members of the Hague-based tribunal. In its 20 years, the ICC has been involved in several high-profile cases, 31 cases have since been brought before the ICC, some of them involving more than one suspect. ICC judges have issued 40 arrest warrants. 21 people have been detained by the ICC detention center and have appeared before the court, while 16 suspects remain at large. And in its latest warrant and first for the Ukraine war, the tribunal called for Putin's arrest on suspicion of unlawful deportation of children and unlawful transfer of people from the territory of Ukraine to the Russian Federation. However, the ICC has been criticized for being biased against African countries and focusing too much on cases in Africa while ignoring crimes committed by more powerful Western countries.
Some argue that since the organization can only prosecute individuals and not states, some powerful countries have used their influence to avoid any ICC scrutiny. So yes, some very powerful states have been arguably able to evade ICC justice, but is something better than nothing when it comes to holding war criminals to account? And where should South Africa stand on its ICC obligations? Well, joining me now to debate that and more are from Moscow, Dmitry Babich. He's a journalist and political analyst at The Voice of Russia. We have Leslie Dikeni in Johannesburg. He's the author of The Poverty of Ideas, South African Democracy and the Retreat of the Intellectuals. He's also a former Africa Secretariat at the UN Human Rights Commission. And from Pretoria is Botsang Moiloa, a political analyst and a former South African diplomat. Thanks all so much for being with me. Botsang, I'll, I'll start with you as a former diplomat yourself. And knowing that part of the argument against the ICC is that men like Putin and Omar al-Bashir should still be allowed to travel as diplomats in spite of international arrest warrants, where do you stand now on South Africa's position? Well, uh, good day to yourself and to the fellow panelists and the, and the viewers. Um, we, should, we should recall that besides the, the protocol or the treaty of the ICC that has been signed by the Republic of South Africa and many other states uh, does not supersede the regulations and or multilateral agreements that the country like South Africa has entered into. For example, we are subject to the Vienna Convention, you know, on diplomatic immunities and treaties and all those things. And, and but besides even this, you know, multilateral forums and agreements that South Africa has signed, we also have domestic laws because all our international laws, well, luckily in South Africa, they get subjected to a parliamentary process and international law process in South Africa before the country enters into those agreements. So we still have domestic laws that we are subject to as a sovereign state that South Africa, when it comes to push, they will apply domestic laws primarily, for example, the supreme law of South Africa, the constitution of the country, then our international policy towards our friends, for obvious reasons, and, and, and okay. neighboring states. And, yes. So really, so, you, you so, feel this is kind of, a, this is an issue of South African sovereignty, um, and that the Vienna Convention, for example, should override whatever the obligations of the ICC are. So in essence, do you think Putin should come to South Africa in August for the BRICS conference? Well, I, I don't want to say override. I don't want to use that word. But South Africa has a, a number of laws and treaties and agreements that they can uh, invoke in this instance. Uh, South Africans, and I personally feel very strongly that uh, Mr. President Putin should be allowed to come to South Africa in respect of the BRICS, you know, uh, 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 forum that is coming up front of the summit, in respect of the international treaties and laws. And, and we all know that, obviously, he will be traveling as a sitting head of state, most probably with a diplomatic passport that is, that is actually subject to the Vienna Conventions. So I think Mr. Putin should be allowed to come to South Africa. But South Africa has made it also very clear why would they view this as an unfair situation? Because every time South Africa is hosting an international forum, then the ICC will come and issue events of arrest mm. for whoever. It's not the first time it happens in South Africa. So it looks like people are being targeted to leave the country, but I don't think they will succeed in South Africa. Remember that this is not just only a historical, political a friend of South Africa and Africa at large, but also is a member of the BRICS member states, which is growing, you know, and, and, and I think okay. uh, the ICC will not, will not see a day over this. Okay. Leslie, uh, do you agree there? And I mean, it's, it's, it seems unfortunate for South Africa that twice now South Africa has been left to arrest a head of state on its own soil. I fully agree with him. Mr. Putin must come. Uh, because we, we are a sovereign country to start with. But I think I'm not a diplomat, I'm a sociologist. So the key important thing for me would be to say that why did South Africa sign up to that convention when uh, France, the UK, and others didn't sign up for this? Mm. But that's 
and that has been for a long time. Actually, it's, it's, I, I, I do. I want to call you up on that now. I'm not sure it is debate for another time. What does South Africa get out of staying in the ICC? Why is it worth <laughs> all this trouble if they simply drop out of their obligations and then they can invite whomever they want? What is South Africa really getting out of staying in? I'm not a, I'm not a diplomat. I'm not representing. I'm asking government. you in your Please. capacity. And I'm asking you. Uh, yeah, I'm answering you. I think uh, South Africa did a good thing to sign up precisely because we do believe in world peace as a country. We do believe uh, uh, in the UN as a system that can function with all its faults. Uh, we do believe in that. We do believe that uh, if there was no UN, we would never have had peace. We do believe in the fact that there must be justice done uh, as we are victims of justice ourselves out of colonialism. We believe that there must be justice done. But the problem with the institution that we are talking about, that's rather the point for me that's important, is to deal with the institution itself, is that that institution was set up, whatever the Southern government decided to do or not, it was set up to make sure that there's justice in the world. But it's not. It has failed and is not doing that justice that it's supposed to be doing. And the key problem is that in Africa as a continent, uh, in Latin America and so on and so on, we are countries and uh, 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 continents that are riddled with conflicts. The ICC okay. is not useful in this case. It's not. It's failing and it will fail because in conflict resolution, you cannot use uh, 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 legal frameworks to deal with conflict. Mm. You oh. will never be able to do so. Okay, but I mean, the impossible. ICC argues, you know, impossible. for all of its that problems, a, uh, for all of its problems. Uh, Hold on, I want to give everybody that. equal time. Um, you know, just to say quickly, the ICC argument is that, yes, they know that there are some, what seems to be an unfair sort of prosecution whereby certain countries are held to standards via the ICC, <laughs> while others are not, we know that. But they do say, you know, justice delayed, for example, is still justice served. In That's the okay. end, justice is That's still delivered. Okay. But yeah, but let me ask Dimitri, because it's, it's important to ask this question, if you think, given what you've just heard from our other two panelists, because, uh, Leslie, you started out by saying that, you know, it's important to sign and be part of what these UN conventions are and delivering international justice, but we know there are problems. So, Dimitri, can South Africa kind of have it both ways? Should they be able to join these these conventions, join you know the the, uh, the have the responsibilities of being an ICC member, uh, but also be able to pull out uh, when they don't agree with a certain stance taken? Uh, well, I, I think I, I agree with what Botsang and uh, what Leslie have just said. I visited South Africa in 2004 before the World Cup. Uh, when, unfortunately, the international media was slandering South Africa, saying that it was a dangerous country, you know, that it was not worthy of holding the World Cup. The World Cup was excellent. So I understand uh, why my colleagues are uh, saying, you know, uh, the reasons for uh, South Africa joining ICC. Modern South Africa is a democratic state, uh, but the people of South Africa have suffered injustice so long that they have the right and they understand, they have the wish to have international justice served next time, if by any chance they are again victims of international injustice. Uh, le let me remind you that in the 60s and the 70s, only the, uh, only the Soviet Union fought for the liberation of Nelson Mandela. Mm. Only the Soviet Union and maybe a few socialist countries, so-called socialist countries, they uh, uh, reminded the world about the apartheid. In the 80s, fighting apartheid became a fashionable subject in the West. But it was only in the 80s. If we go back in right. time, there was a long period. So I understand their reasons. But uh, the reason why I think South Africa objects to ICC warrant against Putin uh, I think it's because we can clearly see here selective justice. Okay, uh, Putin uh, gave an order 
to uh, uh, kind of start the military action in Ukraine. No one disputes that, even though the war in Ukraine started much earlier, in 2014, when the West helped uh, oust the legally elected president and the civil war broke out in Ukraine. In 2014, not in 2022, for eight years, the West was not noticing this war, just like it was not noticing apartheid in South Africa. So if Mr. Putin is held responsible, then why is George Bush the junior who ordered the attack against Iraq is not held responsible? Why is Tony Blair, who participated in that attack against Iraq, why isn't he held responsible? And the other reason, I think, is the accusation by the ICC is very badly formulated. Instead of accusing okay. Putin of starting the war, they accuse him of kidnapping children. You know, I have been working with refugees from Ukraine for eight years. I saw the so-called camps for children. You know, uh, children are spending okay. their summer months with their parents because their cities are being bombarded by Ukrainian troops. Donetsk and Lugansk have been bombarded for eight years. So I understand why South Africa uh, disagrees with the ICC warrant. Uh, and I understand why uh, the uh, ultimate decision, uh, most likely, uh, South Africa will not leave ICC. It will just refuse to fulfill some of the international Okay, that, I mean, that's, that's why it's, that's what's so interesting about this, then, because South Africa does, in this case, get to have it both ways, uh, which well, some argue is part of the problem. But then go ahead. Yes, yes, it's fair. Let's develop the, the, uh, in, in the last few days, last weekend, uh, actually, the ruling party in South Africa, the, the African National Congress, which is the ruling political party in South Africa, decided to implement a Congress decision that was taken firstly in 2012, secondly in 2017, and thirdly in 2022. So every five years, the ruling party had a National Congress to make policy position. One of the resolutions that has been coming out of their elective and policy conferences for the last you know, three terms, it has been that there is no need for South Africa to continue sitting in the ICC if, and they just, they just did not say South Africa should withdraw. Conditions were put to say, let us engage the ICC, let us continue as a country to talk to the ICC to say, if you are going to continue to selectively prosecute and charge countries, particularly of the eastern part of Europe, of Africa, and of Latin America, while the West superpowers are untouchable, even if they are not members of ICC. But they are the ones in the forefront of, you know, uh, uh, creating atrocities against the, right. the children of Palestine, <laughs> the so Iraq war. You can name them. There's quite a few. So there is a policy resolution to say South Africa should consider its position on the ICC. Right. And it is not just that South Africa wants to have both sides. No, there are processes that will be followed, obviously, diplomatic engagements mm. with the ICC in withdrawing the country in that. But, but I, I think the majority of the people in the country and, and the political formations are in support of the ruling parties you know, a resolution to withdraw from the ISIS. Okay, then let me ask Leslie this question, because we've heard this conversation now for years and years. So we've also heard about substituting the ICC in South Africa with this African Court of Justice and Human Rights, yet absolutely nothing has been done to establish such a body. Why not? Well, the, the no, let, me, let me ask Leslie this question. Go ahead, Leslie. Paradigm lost, paradigm regained. Our historical paradigm in South Africa to the world is that in South Africa, we chose a different path for making justice and peace. We did not take PW border, uh, FW declared, to any court. We set up a truth and reconciliation committee. Of course. That can make us negotiate, right? Because if we have done that, take the clear to court, take the report to court, we would never have arrived to the situation that we are in today. Right? So it takes a simple uh, it's quite analysis. quite a different context, though. I'm that. not sure how it's... Unfortunately... Interesting... Sorry? It's quite a different context, though, uh, post-apartheid South is. Africa. No, no, versus what context. we're looking at, international war criminals it is, today. It is, it is exactly in the context. 
We did not do what the Germans did, or what, what, what they, they, this very same international institution did, uh, to take people and put them in a Nuremberg trial. We did not do that. We chose a different path, Mandela's path, which was, let's make peace. Let's see. Right, down but that was specifically together. in a domestic, know, uh, uh, in a domestic yeah. context, not in an international global war. Um, uh, but listen, let me let me ask you this because this applies. is something very important that Dimitri was, was alluding it to. Applies. It applies. Okay. Um, Hold on, uh, both saying I have to come back to you because Dimitri alluded to this, and and I think it's very important because you know there's this sense that South Africa still owes this this debt of gratitude to Russia for Soviet support uh, during the anti-apartheid movement, and that that history should today, Leslie, I don't know if you agree or not. I'll come to you on that, and that you know history today Can should I be go? taken into into consideration. Let me get to both saying first. Uh, but now people are arguing it doesn't matter. Today is today. A war criminal is a war criminal, and history should not oblige South Africa to help defend or protect a war criminal in this context. Do you, you don't see any validity to that? Well, well, Go ahead. I, I don't think any country the court, the, the, the Let court Botsang finish. So Leslie, I'll come back to you. Botsang, go ahead. I don't think any human being or country should live their lives and proceed in life without knowing your history. And I also do not think that you should base yourself moving forward as a nation only on history. Yes, there is a beautiful history between uh, uh, Russia and South Africa during the liberation movement, particularly uh, President Putin. If you know very well that at some stage in the 70s, President Putin himself lived in various African states, particularly in Sadak, to help train the former guerrillas or soldiers of liberation movements in Sadak. So there is that relationship. However, okay. despite that history, we, we, we are not, I don't think South Africa is basing its position and decision on the historical relationship with Russia. I think it's basing it on a principle because I'll tell you why. The Minister of International Relations and Cooperation in South Africa did in one of the interviews state that when all these wars started by any other country, including the war in Ukraine or over Ukraine by NATO and Russia, because it's not a war with Ukraine, it's a war over Ukraine. The South African International Relations Department has been saying, let us take this matters to the United Nations General Assembly instead of the Security Council of which, you know, the perpetrators of this violence are, are sitting in the Security Council. They've always been refusing. Only okay. now that they want to take this matter of Russia, Ukraine to the General Assembly. Something that South Africa has been, you know, talking about over the number of years. Mm. So it's a principal decision. But, but again, going back to... Okay, uh, Botsang, I'm going to have to interrupt you. We only have two minutes left. Leslie, I can give you one minute, and I need to get to Dimitri. Leslie, very quickly, go ahead with your response. Quickly, my response is that uh, that institution must be reformed. It's racist. It's an apartheid institution. Only people that were uh, placed into those courts are only from Africa, uh, Latin America, and so on. It must be changed. Putin in wouldn't fact, be that. Really, let's be honest. The UN itself, in the Security Council, who sits there? It's all the big five. Africans, uh, Latin Americans, okay. have no voice Understood. to say there. Like in all other international global institutions, uh, IMF, World Bank, and so on. We are nothing there but a bunch of uh, uh, Africans okay. who have to sit there and adopt policies. I mean, Let me get to Dimitri. We've got one minute left. Dimitri, quickly, will, will President Putin attend via video link? Uh, because we're hearing that that's going to be the choice to simply make it easier for all involved. He might do that. At what cost? What do you think? Uh, I think uh, President Putin will do everything possible to attend this meeting out of respect for South Africa and other BRICS countries. And I would like to add that the most important thing now is to ta start peace negotiations, to stop the war, to stop the violence, uh, by uh, imposing personal sanctions on Putin and Lavrov, by making it impossible for them to travel to Europe and the United States. The West is uh, hampering peace. It's stopping peace negotiations from being started. It's very nice that South Africa and BRICS countries do not follow that path. In that way, they help peace in Ukraine and in Russia. 
Okay. You don't think, though, President Putin would lose face uh, if he doesn't attend? He Will he have to attend, well, even you, if just for optics? You already called him a war criminal before trial. So uh, under the present situation, when there is a campaign of demonization against Putin and Russia in the Western world, uh, we are not losing face. Okay. We are victims of discrimination. And, of course, Putin will do everything possible to come to South Africa. Dmitry Babich, that will have to be the final word. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for being with us. And our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter. And do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.